Okay, we're going to start recording the session now for uh, T7 RAM. Everybody okay? We're in the right place. Any problems finding it? Yeah, I have an issue finding the page for the book. 41, I think it was, or 44? Yeah, like on my study guide, it doesn't. He's on the PDF one. Oh, you're on the PDF? Yeah, that, that would be difficult. Uh, you would have to go into the PDF itself and then but look at the table of contents of the PDF. And in yeah. there, you'll be able to click directly to the title that uh, Lazaro just told us, which was Understanding RAM, I believe, was the title of that section. Are you doing um, the... Understanding the memory. Memory, thank you. Yeah. Is this the all-in-one book? This is the PDF book. That's the classwork that's attached to uh, your books and materials. What chapter is that in the study? In the study chapter one. It's chapter one still? Okay. Let's yeah, see. chapter one. No. Everyone able to see my screen or the least near pod, one of the two? Yes. Okay. Our main objectives for this one is going to be to define system memory and describe the different technologies, articulate the processes, including question to answer when upgrading memory itself, determining how to select and purchase memory modules. As we stated before, not every memory coincides with every motherboard, so we need to make sure what to buy. Summarize the process of installing memory, identifying common pitfalls when selecting or installing memory, and identifying common problems that come up with memory and describe how to solve them overall. Has anybody ever uh, installed memory themselves or worked with memory? Um, I have. I have also. I have too. Have you ever had problems installing memory and then figured out that it was actually not the right one? Or maybe you put it in game backwards, one of the two. I've done the second one. <laughs> yeah. That I've happened. been lucky. That happens a lot when you first start. You, you forget to try to line it up and then you're looking at yourself and you're like, that's wonderful. I'm, I messed up putting uh thermal co uh, compound though that's something I, that's a big time it's not nice it's mean to them to the cpu i would have never do that to a cpu i don't I like you, anymore. you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so there's obviously common pitfalls and uh by obviously usually with our mistakes and or ho hopefully learning prior to that from other people's mistakes we can try to uh Avoid that. Lasso, if you can help us with this slide here, key terms and memory. All right, key terms of memory. Volatile memory lose its contents when the power is turned off. That's RAM. Non-volatile memory retains its contents when power is turned off. That's disk memory or solid state. Unbuffered memory deals directly with the chipset controller. And the buffered memory contains a buffer to help the chipset handle a large electric load if the system has a lot of memory. So it kind of like holds off the memory. Single side RAM has chips on one side of the stick or the DIMM. And then double side RAM has chips on both sides of the uh, DIMM. Yes, thank you. Now that, that uh, one there is the key terminologies, but uh, there is one that uh, kind of contradicts itself. The double-sided RAM, sometimes they mean in reference uh, to something else, it's just double loaded and it's really on one side of the chip itself, but it's still the same uh, type of RAM. So overall, memory definition is area within the computer where information is being stored. We have to understand the memory itself, especially the RAM is temporarily, and like anything else, it's all zeros and ones. At no point does it really read this document or as you can see right now, this presentation means absolutely nothing to your computer. 
this is only to your benefit to be able to see the visual representation. Everything in the back looks like the matrix, basically all just zeros and ones turning off and on to be able to re represent a, a actual digital screen and or document whatever it is that it's trying to do. So Jordan, if you can help us out with this one, this slide. From non-volatile and permanent, cannot change instructions unless it's replaced. Store system information such as the post routine, BIOS programs, or boot instructions. The types of ROM chips are programmable, uh, programmable ROM, PROM, erasable programmable ROM, EEPROM, electrically erasable programmable ROM, E, <laughs> EEPROM. Yeah. Okay, so uh, those are obviously the ROM. Anybody want to tell me exactly where what is the ROM and where is it used usually? Usually motherboards for its file system or UE, UEFI, I think is what it's called. IOS or UEFI. Or for example, to keep its firmware. settings. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Some type of firmware, be it BIOS or be something permanent that's not going to be erased. That's only read only memory. That's one of the ways you can remember it. You can only usually read only. Obviously, there is the new chips, like they just said here, uh, programmable, erasable, programmable, and electrical. But the original ones and the main purpose of these is usually it's going to store it and have it. No matter what, you can unplug it, take out the batteries, and the information will retain itself. Um, question, Diego. So that means the CMOS would not be considered um, read-only, right? No, it's a RAM. It's a RAM. Got it. A RAM chip. Because of the fact that as soon as I take off my uh, battery and take out the actual power from the unit, it will erase all of the information. It's only meant to store temporarily the information there and the reason for the actual battery is for that to ensure that it always retains power and it mim it's very minimal power required to to obviously keep that information and it keeps your clock and everything in there got it thank you not a problem so who else we have here daniel ram if you can ask, help us with the random access memory here Yes, um, dynamic RAM stores data for only a fraction of a second before losing it. To maintain stored data, the system must constantly refresh DRAM. This reduces performance. DRAM is packaged as SIMS or DIMS. Static RAM retains information without the need for refraining as long as the computer's power is on. CMOS RAM is a memory that uses a small battery to keep its well, Volatile. volatile volatile state always retained it stores almost all motherboard configuration data and central's dram designed to operate at clock speed if the system bus is 100 megahertz then cd ram mm -hmm. matches the frequency cd ram is referred to with a pcxx where the xx is the bus speed thank you so yes as you can see, there's very different types of RAMs out there. Uh, like I said, you have the single inline memory and you have the dual, there's SIMs and DIMs. That's all it means when you hear SIMs or DIMs, that's the only difference. There's still dynamic RAM, both of them. There's no difference except for that. Ah, mouse come back, thank you. Overview of an SD RAM used obviously in most modern systems now. RAM that holds instructions and data used by the CPU. They connect through the North Bridge, as we stated before, or a memory chip controller. If it, if, if it is there, you'll see another one close to like the thing that we've seen for uh, the Super I.O. Something similar, you're going to see another chip where it kind of flows everything through there. It's tied to the system clock like the CPU and the MCC, so the result is little wasted time. A lot of these chips also tell you what they call the clock cycle. The amount of time the, the actual 
cycles it takes to get through the whole memory module. The lower the number, the faster the memory module. The, fast, the higher the number, obviously the longer it's gonna take going through the whole clock cycle by the time it gets through the whole RAM. So you have your form factor memory slots and banks. Anybody know who or remember what a form factor is? The shape of the device. In this case, um, the pins and the dims and lose you what kind of system to go into. Okay. So in this, uh, the form factor, uh, the standard one, right? There's standard, there's ATX, there's mini ATX, and all these uh, different types of boards. Uh, and here they're showing us the dual inline memory modules for PCs are so dims, are the small ones. So this one would be like on a, mem uh, on a maybe a mini ATX, right? Compared to a regular ATX board. So depending on the actual uh, form factor, you'll see also the micro dim. Thank you. So what role overall does RAM play in your computer? It helps the CPU tremendously. Okay. Alexa, uh, how else does it, except for helping it tremendously, can you tell me what does it really do uh, for it? Is it uh, absolutely necessary to, to uh, use it? What's its ultimate goal? What exactly does it do and why is it important? Um, I believe it has something to do with the memory, like it helps the memory. Okay. So random access memory, so we could understand, is where the information of your programs are. So when you open your operating system, you open up a program, it stores that information there and it relays it between the CPU and itself and obviously getting stuff from the hard drive, right? Those three we learned are intertwined in what they call the processing part of the computer. If I don't have enough RAM, what happens is, as you can see here, I have another window in the background. Do we all agree? This actually gets stored in, in the Windows operating system on what they call a page file swap. So this is a temporary uh, location in your hard drive that mimics a RAM. Why would I do that? Is because I run out of resources the more windows that I open up. And the only thing that I'm, I really care about as a human is what's up front. So the computer to be able to run and do everything that's in here, what you're physically seeing, my mouse moving around is annoying the living daylights out of the memory, me going into the menu, any of these things that I am doing now now is basically being run on between the cpu and the memory itself as for the long term then that would be your hard drive that is what it where it's stored and if i want to go open up my folder now and look up a uh, file a specific file i am now accessing the hard drive and attempting to open up the information that it has been long term served in there Questions and doubts in reference between RAM, CPU, which is the processor, he's the one that's routing everything, right? And then your hard drive. I got questions about the pin. Uh, we're gonna get to that later? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a total of 32 slides. Yeah, I'm so confused with the pins because there's so many. Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah, this is, it gets pretty bad, the pin out. So the DDR, the double data rate or SD RAMs, you have a double amount of transfer per clock, effectively doubling the memory bandwidth. It uses an, a 184 connector. Uh, the SODIM is 200 and the micro is 172. These things are stuff that we obviously, unfortunately need to learn. And the most thing that we need to learn is the variance between the, the actual different types of modules. Because if it tells me it's a, a uh, 200 megahertz or a 400, I could most likely guess that it's much faster. There is a mathematical way of calculating the dual channels and everything in here. Anybody know exactly what it is? 
I think it's a clock speed times the width. In other words, like eight bits. Yeah, it's eight times. So you'll notice here that my here's my megahertz is a clock speed, right? But then the the speed rating of the DDR, that's my this is the clock speed. Everybody remember that's that little guy that has just like two little uh two little sticks coming down, right? And it has a weird little head. Everybody remember the the clock? That's on the motherboard. That's just one little chip. So this is my clock speed here. And this is the DDR speed rating of the actual module. If you multiply this number by eight, you will get the PC speed rating. Eight times 200, we could all agree, equals 1,600. Questions, doubts? Eight times four, 32. So when I was reading the Michael Myers, I was just a little bit confused. I know that some of them are architectural designs, make it more efficient. But the part I don't get is, what does he mean by doubling the, me uh, the memory bandwidth and actually giving more performance well, versus the, the actual real-time speed? Twice. What do you mean by that is that in the clock itself, and on the up and down, it actually talks twice. Instead of waiting for, for the next one, next clock to talk, it actually talks in, in anyone know uh, how to read music, knows what a quarter note is? Yeah. So you, here's your quarter note, right? That's a, every time I hit down, you can pretend that's the clock, right? Now what happens is when you double it, instead of having quarter notes, you have eights because as soon as I bring it up and he's up here, He's actually sending or receiving information. Same as when he pushed down now. So the, the normal module always had to wait until the count came down. Here now I'm. Oh, so it's faster. So that's what they mean by double, as in yep. it's faster per yeah, clock it speed. Eight, it becomes eight notes. eight notes. Instead of quarter notes, you could think of it as eight notes. It's much faster. It's double the speed uh, because of, of the double the through, throughput is really what's happening. Okay, I think I get it. So your dual technology, as we uh, learned, which is those uh, beautiful colors they usually put on the board, uh, uses obviously DDR, SDRAM sticks, which are in each, and they must coincide. They have to be identical. If your clock speed, uh, uh, if the two DDR modules are not the same, for instance, if I get one that's 400 and the other one's 200, doesn't matter if they're the exact same size, it's not gonna work. Not matching with the clock speed and or ratings. You'll have problems. They must match when they have this type of dual channel technology. Is this the same for latency? I'm sorry? Is this the same for latency? Latency. Uh, latency would be more in reference to speed of uh, uh, overall. So if, if you have a, a single channel, it's going to be slower than a dual. So this one will be obviously much faster. Because now, uh, two, no, I mean like, separate than the four? No, like, I mean, like, for the actual ranks, I remember reading the book, like, C17, C19, referring to how long it takes to do an action. What if one of the RAMs has that kind of latency? Or it doesn't matter because in dual channel, they both work together and they both have the same latency. Correct. They'll be, they'll, they have to be talking at the same speed and everything. If not, it's not going to work. As for latency, I'm not understanding your question exactly what you mean by latency at that point. That's where I'm getting confused. Because I know there's a latency um, between them. In the book, uh, Michael Myers was saying that it's like, LC17 referring to there's a delay within the 17 clock and then That's the 19. Clock, like CL, CL clock. You're talking about the clock, which would be if the latency of how many times the clock has to go around before he gets through the whole RAM. So that, that's the latency you're speaking of. And now I understand yes. your question. So each yeah, RAM so has its clock. clock speed or, or clock cycle, sorry, clock cycles. And that's the number you're talking about. So the, the number, the higher that number is, the more latency you're gonna have, the longer it takes for it to get through the whole mo module. So if you have a 16 gig module 
with a, a clock cycle of 20, it will take 20 times for that little doohiggy to go around before he gets through the whole memory versus another uh, me memory module who, whose clock uh, cycle is five. That's four times faster. So he's going to go through it. By the time he goes through his clock cycle, the fifth, that's it. He's gone through in the whole 18 or 16 gigs. Compared to the other module, he's still got to wait for the 20 cycles to be completed before he can finish. Slower latency modules. That's what the CL gives you. It tells you how fast the, the CPU and the clock can talk to that, to that memory. Thank you for the question and clarifying. Everybody understand what he's talking about? About the uh, clock cycles on the book? I believe we'll be getting to those uh, soon in here. So as we stated a second ago, we got to make sure that they're in pairs. So reds and blacks should be the same. So if I have 216 here, I can have two eights or 232s. As long as they're the same clock and type, it doesn't matter. Next is our DDR2. This is a little bit faster while using less power. Increases, comes back again, clock doubling. Yeah, I input out, output circuits on the chips. This doesn't speed up the core of the RAM, but it does in reference to the input and output of the information. Uses an, a 240-pin connector. It's not compatible with your regular DDR. It is double the amount of a regular DDR. You'll notice here now uh, that it, the um, IO is 200 megahertz here, the clock speed 100, and then if I multiply the first one, it's already at 32. I go back to, remember, not until I got to all the way down here on the DDR did I get to 32. In essence, doubling my speed from 16 to 32. You will find motherboards using both single channel and dual channel DDR modules. So the DDR2, these modules are obviously newer modules than the old modules, which are the regular double data rate RAMs or SD RAMs. Remember, the easiest way to remember these is that they'll probably give you either the PC rating or the DDR speed rating. So all you gotta know is the math. It's either I'm gonna multiply by eight or I'm gonna divide by eight to come back to my DDR2 module. There's nothing out of extraordinary that should be going on here. These here are in reference to the clock speed of the, uh, of the motherboard and the input output speed of the actual uh, unit. If you'll notice, it's double. Here's my clock. And since the clock is talking at 100 and I am talking twice, doing that action, right? I'm at 200 megahertz instead of 100 megahertz. Did that make sense? Well, there's my core. That's my, that little chip on the actual clock. But the DDR, the two, gives me double the megahertz speed. Next is the DDR3. Once again, it is more efficient. This is next generation of modules. Uh, they are about 30% lower power consumption, and it doubles, again, the buffer from four to eight, giving you, obviously, a much more bandwidth over the older RAMs. So if we notice, instead of being at 32, where are we now? We're at 64. Another thing that you need to notice, I'll go back over here, PC rating, DDR, you see this? There's nothing in front of, or I'm sorry, uh, succeeding the DDR, except for a dash. When I get to my DDR2s or my PCs, purposely, they make sure that you're fully aware that it is DDR2 and the PC2. So if you see either of these two numbers, you already know that you're in a, this type of module. When we get to this one, again, they switch out the number for you, so there's no doubts. It's PC3 or DDR3. 
So if I multiply by eight, a DDR3, 800, I get 64, right? Questions, doubts, and then um, if you notice, it's, what did they say? It's four times faster, right? So one times four, boom. This times four, that guy. Three times four, 1,200. Got a quick question. What's the benefit of having a triple channel or quad channel? Is there a natural benefit or it's the same as dual? If you have like two duals versus just one quad. The more channels, the faster it is. Mm -hmm. The but, more channels you have, you see? Well, what I'm saying is what is the difference from um, having two dual channels versus just a quad channel? Remember, the more you have here in your in your here's dual channel. So imagine if you can, if it supports triple, you have more space. So you're gonna have the 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 more uh, capacity per channel. Quad channel. This is just dual channel, right? Two. Oh, so for example, that's actually a quad, right? This or it's just double. dual channel? This that's dual. double. Yeah, so imagine three modules or four modules per channel. So that's what a quad means then, right? Yeah. I have a question about um, mm -hmm. the pins. They have the same number of pins as DDR2, but they're just placed differently? Yeah, 240, okay. 240. And the only one that's different is this guy here. And then you got the so dims that are 200, 172 micro dims. So they all have their their names here. You'll see here the DDR2 so dim. The only difference is the size. The so dim versus the regular dim is that the so dim would be for like a, an ATX, the mini ones, or or some other uh, mother motherboard that's small, right? Whenever you see the, the so dim itself. Here's your 20, 240 pin, slotted different. And then we can see here, here's your DDR. You see the slot spot right here? DDR2, a little bit more towards the middle. And then DDR3, which is the easiest, is completely off centered. Either which way, these slots will not allow you to install from one computer to the other. If it's not aligning, it won't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. No? All right, Never mind. I saw Jordan laugh, so I'm okay there. <laughs> Somebody got it. All right, so uh, DDR3L and DDR4, it's a lower uh, voltage uh, than the DDR. Obviously, that means less heat and obviously power uh, consumption uh, for servers and data center. It runs at the 1.25 compared to 1.5 or 1.6. Offers higher density and lower voltages than the DDR, and there could be obviously up to 512 gigabytes in DDR4. Again, we'll notice here, here's our clock. Now, instead of being four times, You'll notice that in this one, I am eight times, right? Because I keep on doubling it. I started at one, I went to two, went to four, now I'm eight. Over here, once again, now, this one, if I multiply the 1,600 times the eight, I believe it is, we should get there. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, eight times 16. Eight times 16, Siri, what is it again? 128. Thank you for confirming, Siri. That was very nice of you. So yeah, so it's still eight. Any questions, doubts? Here's my DDR4 instead of three in the front and PC4. So this is the PC speed rating versus the DDR4 speed rating. It's the speeds. All we got to do is recognize if we're multiplying or dividing, guys. Don't go crazy trying to memorize all these numbers because God only knows, I'm pretty sure, nobody memorizes all these numbers. We just need to know that if we're here with a PC 
four in front, I divide by eight, and it gives me this speed, 1,600. Questions, doubts? Here's your latency that you were saying earlier. The definition overall is RAM responses to electrical signals, which varies in rates. The delay of RAM's response time is latency itself. The lower the latency, the better, which is the CL that we said a couple of seconds ago, the clock cycles delays. It's the amount of time it takes for the clock to get through the whole RAM. So the amount of time that goes around in that circle. So, can somebody tell me which of these two modules would, would be more expensive if I'm reading here? We, we're learning how to read. We said we're looking for what should I look for? Lower latency. No, this right here, what am I pointing to right here? Uh, clock latency. Right? And the other guy that I'm looking for is this guy, right? DDR3, DDR4, those things with the number behind them was, or PC4 or PC3. Whatever it is, is going to tell me. So, what's the uh, clock speed on DeAndre on the first module here? What's the clock cycle? Sorry. Clock cycles. Would it be 2,133? What's, what's next to CL? Clock cycle. Is that six? What is that a five? That is a six, yes. So that would be six. So that's six cycles. Uh, it is a, a D3 and 2133. So I don't feel like doing the math. 2133, this guy here. Uh, next one, he is uh, Daniel. Can you tell me what's the clock cycles on this one? On the second module? How many clock cycles? Sorry, I have myself. Uh, it's like nine. Nine, okay. We agree though, both modules are D3 2133s, D3 2133s. One's clock cycle is six, the other one's nine. Which one's faster? The first one. I agree. Everybody agree? So when we are into that predicament, now that we know what these little things mean, whenever we see these stickers on there and or imprinted on a memory module, we should now be able to recognize who's who, right? Because it's going to say it on there. That's another reason why I wouldn't kill myself too much. Uh, I should be able to start recognizing them little by little, obviously, because in the test they're going to ask you, but in real life, these stickers is what you need to be able to, uh, to read and understand that D3 2133CL6 is a much better module than this one. Obviously, a D3 is much faster than a D. If had I had a D2133 clock cycle 4 compared to a D3 2133 clock cycle 6, you bet my bottom dollar I'm jumping on this guy, right? He's much faster because a D3, we learned, is what? Four times faster than any Ds, any, re any regular D, right? If I have a regular D RAM, although the clock cycle may be faster in reference to latency, the throughput is not. I would have four times throughput on a D3 compared to a regular D module. We agree? Because a D2 is twice as fast as a regular D module, and a D3 is four times faster, or four times the thru throughput than a regular D module. Questions or doubts on how to read this or determine which module is faster or has less latency if they're both the same type of modules? Let's go to break here. I'm exactly at 10.15. I'll see you guys at 10.30. with reading the modules themselves 
and understanding what CL means, what D3 or D2 or R2D2, uh, C3PO, whoever they might throw at you, are you able to read it out? Nobody I have a question. question. Um, for the CL, the clock, why is the six better than the nine again? Okay. So the clock, if we recall, is the motherboard. You could always think of it as the bus, as I always uh, said. So you're riding the bus. And this is why I, I kind of laugh when they tell me that they have the latest and greatest CPU. You're only as good as your, your slowest connection, as we said. So the bus has its own speed. <clears throat> that's the reason for uh, that's the reason for the North Bridge and the South Bridge is because since as it is, the IOs that are all the way on the South Bridge are so slow and the bus, the motherboard clock speed is so slow, uh, there is cycles that it needs to go through. So depending, the memory itself, to not create any other problems, it has what they call clock cycles. Could you, could you imagine if the clock had it to wait up to the 20 to be able to talk to anybody else? In other words, the clock would have to go over 20 times, right? Just to talk to anybody else, right? So what they've done is, to, for you to understand exactly what's going on, the, the, the amount of time or the amount of cycles that the clock goes through, in other words, the amount of electricity that, that it goes through on that little bus on the motherboard, it's gonna take six times for it to get through the whole module, from the beginning of the module to the end of the module. Versus the other one, it takes nine times to go all the way around before it can read the whole module. Same size, same type of module, but it will take nine times as, as long. Thank you so much. That's perfect. So it's just pretend whenever you're dealing with memory, when it comes to clock cycles, play, you're playing golf. The lower the number, the better it is. <laughs> Let me know if you find a negative one module, right? That, that would be a good one. One under par. Mm -hmm. All right. The next thing that some memories have. So we learned what all memories have, but some of them have what they call data integrity or error detection. Usually a lot of these robust memories, you'll find them more on servers or some other type of high-end machines. Not, you're not going to have all this fancy schmancy stuff. Uh, parity. Anyone rem uh, know what parity is? No one? No. Um, hold on. I think I know what it is. It's, um, it's, it's the RAM check and see if the data is correct. Yeah, parity check is basically is one extra bit of data, and basically is to make it either even or odd, right? And the majority of thing is is to pair it up. Remember, it's all zeros and ones. So pretend that um, I have so many zeros and ones inside this uh, module. What it does is at the end it'll put either a zero or a one to make it a pair so that when you add all those numbers, it is a, an even number. What happens if I lose one of those zeros and ones prior to my parity check, then I know that the, the information is corrupted. Did that make sense? So let me see if I can open up here. I believe I have the capabilities of sharing a whiteboard or something like that. There we are. So you have your straights, zeros, and ones, right? And then what happens is, the lack of a, that will be a nibble, right? Four pieces. What he'll do is he'll go in here and do the anding little trick and notices that there is a one missing. So what happens is that in the module, when he goes and reads this, if something happens here, he knows right away that this information is corrupted. I am missing information. It's gotta be an even number when I finish. And if I'm missing this guy and he becomes a zero, 
I have a, a total of an odd number. That's not good. Now, it only tells me that there's something bad. It's not going to be able to correct the, the issue. It just tells me that there's something bad, right? MCC uses a bit of, uh, uh, to verify the data that is correct only versus you have an error correcting coding or ECC. These are for the high-end servers. It's used uh, uh, basically much more robust. So now I know that I'm missing something. So I have that parity check, but this one can actually on the fly correct those errors. He knows exactly which one it was and puts back the one where it's supposed to be or the zero. Questions or doubts on what a parity is versus an ECC module. Uh, so these are all features within the, the RAM itself. This would be, like I said, more towards the high-end servers. You wouldn't get this unless if you wanted to have a very fancy computer for no reason. Uh, this is uh, basically unnecessary, uh, even for gaming purposes. You, by the time the computer notices what the error is or the bit that you're missing, you're already halfway through the board anyways, right? It's not gonna, it's, it's unnecessary data at that point. This is more for servers not to lose your information. Much more expensive and obviously ECC RAM is slower because it's got more stuff it's gotta do, right? He's gonna have to make sure that every time he's writing and he's doing this little bar parody little trick here, that he's keeping track of everything. It's much more smarter memory. Questions versus, uh, on what's parity or ECC before we continue? Can you go over a parity again? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Give me one second here. So parity <coughs> in itself, let me see where I can, this thing now is giving me problems. Where's it going? Okay. So let's pretend this is a nibble. You remember what a nibble is? Nibble is four bits. One, a bit is either a one or a zero, do we agree on that? So a nibble would be four bits. Pretend this is inside the actual module. So what the parity bit will, will do is inside this little parity bit box, he will decide by what they call anding, he's gonna take all these numbers and add them up. One plus zero plus one plus zero is an even number, do we agree? It becomes two. So since it is two, do I put a one or a zero here as my parity bit if I was a memory module? If it is an even number, should I put zero to make it even or should I put a one to make it even? Zero. Correct. Because if I put a zero here, it equals two still. And now the memory, when he comes back and he looks at this, as long as it's an even number, he knows that nothing has been lost. Had it been that this guy here has a one, now what should I do with my parity bit over here if I was the RAM? I have one, 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 zero on my nibble. What should be my parity bit? To make it an even one. number. You guys one. get it? Yeah, thank you, yes, one. You guys get that? Okay, I'm, I'm understanding now. So this is, the green area would be the actual information that's coming in. The ones and zeros coming into it. 
And then this guy here is the way he's able to have a parity check to make sure that there's nothing missing from where he's at. That's the way the parity check works. This is not only on memory. We're going to find that out also in hard, hard drives. There, there's a, um, a thing called RAID and how they use parity checks also for that. So we need to make sure we understand what this extra little bit, a one or a zero, does. Everyone okay with that? So that would be my parity here. So a more robust one is what we know as the ECC. So the ECC, not only does he actually do what we see here, he actually keeps track of this area also. So the moment that by mistake this becomes a one, he quickly, sorry, becomes a zero, he quickly goes and puts it back on. He's able to tell without having to deal with anything else that that should have been turned back on. That's what I have as what was a in stored in that location. He's much slower, much more expensive, does much more than what is anticipated on any type of memory. Where do we use it? Inside a server. A very, very robust server that requires perfection. Not, doesn't want to lose anything. Doesn't want the application to crash. Thank you for the question. Is there any other doubts in reference to parity or ECC? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. What happens when, like in parity, you can't correct the error? What What happens after that? Well, nothing. I just go and ask the CPU to give me everything back. I can't do oh, anything. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's it's only to lets it know that it's useless, so it goes back and asks for it again. That's all it does. It's so that you don't get it uh, uh, some type of crash or on your screen. Sometimes you get some weird little glitch. It just automatically knows this is useless to me. Give it give it back. I need I need it. I need it again. That's all it tells them. Compared to my regular memory, if I lost it, you might see a glitch in the screen or some weird thing on the refresh or even a blue screen uh, uh, of depth, depending on how bad the fault was. Any other questions on parity or ECC? Everybody like my drawing? No? All right. So registered or buffered memory. If we can get uh, Carlos, if you could read out for me here and help me out. I'm running out of saliva here. Sure. All right. <clears throat> registered or buff um, buffered memory. Memory that has a register between it and the memory controller. The register stores bits of information in such a way that systems can write to or read out all the bits simultaneously. It reduces the load on the controller and allows the device to support much more money, I'm um, sorry, money, <laughs> much more memory than would be possible otherwise. It is used for service. A possible effect is an introduction of, of latency and a drop in performance. Thank you. So any questions or doubts on, on that? I think it's self-explanatory in reference to rest, registered or buffered memory. One good feature, as we saw here in the register, it actually can write or read out bits simultaneously at the same time. It, re it also reduces the, the load on the controller itself, but it is a little bit of latency, right? Costs a little bit of, of latency. What's the actual real world benefit of using that? especially in a server. On a server. Well, if you have a lot of users pounding you, remember, memory is what I use to be able to, to process information and do stuff. So if I have buffered memory, registered memory, a lot of times things that might have 
be repetitive to to me is in that stored memory. It's it's going to have uh, capability of buffering instead of loosing it. If we remember RAM, instantly is gone. As soon as I use it, I throw it to you in, in the screen. You just moved your head. What was in my RAM is gone. Well, you now you moved it again. Now a new RAM came in. Every single second, RAM is being refreshed. It's never is ne never stagnant. In this one, it will be in there. It will be buffered. It doesn't leave. Oh, okay. It's like a proxy server in, in networking. Yeah, you could think of it as like a load balancer uh, on a network where the load balancer, he's kind of making sure that he, or not a load balancer, what's it called? Those, those farm, yeah, load balancer where you have a whole bunch of different servers and it kind of, uh, on, on your instance too, a proxy server, sometimes it caches Google for you, right? So you, when you go to the proxy, sometimes you're not really going to Google. You're going to your proxy server who has a stored cache information of that page. And then it will then push you the information. And then whenever you search, it'll give you the real information to refresh your screen. But the initial thing, you'll also notice in your own computer, sometimes you don't have internet and you open up Google and it says Google's right there. But then you hit search and it's not. That would be a, a buffered information that was uh, in your cache of your hard drive. Not to be mis uh, misconstrued with buffer memory, but that's just an example of what it's doing. Uh, so, yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Not a problem. Any questions or doubts? Anybody ever see, uh, well, what was his name? Jesus, no, I just missed it. Spaceballs. Spaceballs, anyone? No? Uh, Funny. Yes. <laughs> Just remember the conversation and where are we? Are we in now now or are we in then now? We just missed it just now. That's your RAM. <laughs> when you just thought you had it, you just missed it because it went right out the door. It's so fast. It never really keeps any information. That's why they created these for the, for the actual servers, what they call buffer memory. It actually buffers the information and keeps it. And that's what's creating that latency because it's actually buffering the information in there. Good question. Thank you. Justin, if you could access, uh, help us with uh, access speed here. Okay. Access speed is the amount of time in nanoseconds that it takes the RAM to provide the requested data to the memory controller. It ensures that add-on memory is the same speed and, or the uh, same speed or faster than existing memory. Do not mix memory modules with different speeds in the same bank. The rows of slots for adding memory. Check the motherboard specifications for the required speed. Nanoseconds. That's quick. Any questions on this slide? I think, it, once again, this one's pretty self-explanatory, right? We've mentioned it before. We don't want to mix modules at different speeds, as that's not going to work. If it's there in the same bank or channel, uh, you're not, they're not going to be able to work together, right? Makes sense. As we learned from the clock cycles and or speed, that's not going to work because they're not talking at the same speed. Another thing that we can think about it is in the old record players, uh, the 33s and the 45s. Anybody remember those? But it's it's just like a speeding up or slowing down uh, the the conversation, uh, speaking as fast as the chipmunks, and or speaking as slow as this. The two computers are not going to be able to understand it because of that crash in the middle. It's all electronical signals. There's no way they'll be able to understand each other at the different rates. So we have our serial, uh, serial presence detect, SPD. Christina, if you can help us with this one. Serial presence detect. When a computer is booted, SPD tells the basic input output system BIOS all the information about the RAM, the module size data with speed and voltage. This information is stored in an electrical, erasable, programmable, read-only memory, EE prom. Okay. Can anybody tell me what does BIOS stand for? Uh, 
basic input right output in the, the S system. Yeah, it's right here, just in case. Basic input output system. That's the old one, right? And the UEFI is the new one, right? Here's your little clock. Anybody recognize that guy real quick? That's the guy I kept on alluding to earlier. That's your clock. That's the bus. That's fast. how the motherboard, the fastest the motherboard can go itself. Not your CPU, but your bus. The backbone. Just like your spinal. Yes. Is it, what is the actual name? Is it a crystal or is that something else in the motherboard? Crystal is something else. That's the little silver thing you see right above it, actually. This guy you're saying? Yeah, I was wondering, oh, I thought the crystal is what keeps the clock speed, right? But is the bus? No, I'm just saying it's the same. Your bus, this is what controls your bus. The bus is the motherboard, the backbone. In other words, oh, every okay, little, address. See, see this right here? These little lines, that's part of the bus. All this pathway back here, everything that interconnects, all those little lines that if I would happen to flip over a motherboard, it's all those channels. That's your bus. They hear your clock speed. He controls the bus, how fast the bus can talk. Make sense or no? I got it. Okay. So when to upgrade RAM? Your main systems, obviously, the computer is very slow. Windows is complaining themselves about insufficient memory, excessive hard drive accessing. Why would I be accessing so much the hard drive? Anybody remember from something I said earlier? What would cause that? Virtual memory. In other words, a swap. Uh, in order to keep it working. That's correct. So if we look here, you guys can still see my screen, right? If I come into my computer, and I believe these over here, you have the capabilities of creating your own page swap anytime soon. Of course, I gotta lose myself in the control panel. We'll get back to that guy. But there is a, a, a possibility in your system, which is in the properties of the system. Where did that screen go? Advanced properties. There he is. He's on the other screen. Sorry about that, guys. And in here, you'll be able to, in itself, create much more space if you want to. Easy hardware. I lost myself. Anybody know where it is exactly? Environment. There we go. No. Why did I lose myself? I could have sworn he was in here. Uh no, for sure. At lunchtime, I'll get it by lunchtime. Anyways, so the page swap file itself is what the, the hard drive uses as fake memory. The computer uses a partial hard drive, which is reserved. You can leave it by itself by Windows, or you could determine yourself how much you want to be able to uh, use for that computer. It obviously stores it temporarily, so therefore, whatever's in my background will be in my virtual memory, which is why you would have excessive uh, hard drive if you're running out of memory a lot, is using the page file swap to be able to, to, to do the process. Questions or doubts on memory or it using a page file to be able to create and mimic more memory for itself. What to consider when upgrading? How much RAM, did I finish? Yes, I did, sorry about that. How much RAM do I need and how much is allowed by the OS? Did anybody know that if you went and purchased so much memory that maybe your computer won't even care? What's the maximum memory I can use on a 32-bit operating system? Anyone? I think it's 16. Either 16 or 32. Let's see. Oh, it says four gigabytes. That is correct. And you'll see that a lot of these new computers are coming with eight gigabytes. So guess what? 
if they gave you a 32-bit operating system, you have four gigs that are doing So be careful what you buy. Wait, can you say that again? I'm so sorry. The 32-bit systems, the maximum they can reach in reference to memory would be a maximum of four gigs of RAM. That is their actual limit that the operating system will be able to understand. We will be getting into the details on the 1002 on why when we get to operating systems itself. So we need to be careful what are we buying and, and what is it for? Because if, if we have the old 32-bit systems or we have the cheap version of <clears throat> Windows OS, uh, that's not going to do it. We're going to basically be wasting our money. The extra memory will not be recognized at all by the OS. He can care less. And what's even funnier is that your BIOS is recognizing it. So when it boots up, you see 8 gigs. <laughs> but when you get into Windows, he can care less about the extra 4. Questions? Doubts? So at that point, the problem is not your computer. It's the operating system. You would have to install a 64-bit operating system that gives you much more uh forgot it's some ridiculous amount of memory um uh, it's like a trillion terabytes or some ridiculous amount of, of amount of memory questions or doubts next one how many and what kind of memory modules are currently installed on the motherboard because if we only have so many slots and we go and buy and we don't have space for it, once again, we're gonna run into the problem. We need to be fully aware if it is that maybe I have four eight bit modules, right? Sorry, four eight gigabytes module, and I wanna swap them out for maybe four 16, right? That I can do, or maybe take out two of the eights and put two 16s. But I gotta be fully aware of what is the motherboard capable of and what is in there so that I don't waste my money. How many and uh, sorry, how many, how do I select and purchase the right modules for my upgrade? Anybody got a guess on that one? Your motherboard's manual or whatever the manufacturer says on the website for the motherboard and yeah. what it's compatible with. Correct. You go into the actual manufacturer of the motherboard or to the manufacturer of the computer, let's say it's a Dell or an HP, you can go there and usually they'll tell you uh, what are the, the specifications that are allowed, what type of modules, what, what's the maximum CPU and the type of CPU that you should be purchasing. How do I physically install new modules? Anyone fully aware of how do I physically install new modules? Or do we mean the entire process? Or just like in terms of pressing down the tabs, picking it up, and putting it back in? Mm -hmm. You guys can see this video? You guys see the video? Yes. All right, cool, cool, cool. Let me know if you can hear it or not. Yes. This is a small little brief video of somebody installing a RAM. Yeah, basically, uh, as you stated, so we get all. Be able to be this more memory. Installing more RAM is an easy upgrade with the newest and greatest features. Before you get started, make sure you have the right type of RAM for a proper configuration. RAM is like batteries. You'll want to use an even number of the same size and speed. If you want 16 gigabytes of memory, you'll want to use a pair of 8 gigabyte sticks or four 4 gigabyte sticks. Some computers may use sets of three instead of pairs, so make sure to check your chipset's instructions before running out and buying any. Also, make sure your computer can support the speed and type of the RAM you purchased. Most modern computers support DDR3 up to 1600 megahertz, but you'll need to check your current setup and motherboard specifications to know for sure. The first step is to ensure you aren't going to fry any chips with static electricity. If you have an anti-static wristband, connect to the bare metal of the case. Next, remove any old memory you don't plan on using by pressing down on the tabs on each end of the stick. Before you just jam the new RAM into the slots, check your motherboard's manual to see if there's support for dual-channel or tri-channel memory. This will either be indicated in the manual for your motherboard, 
or by colored pairs or trios of different colored RAM slots, which will dictate where the stick goes. If there are any, follow the instructions for the installation listed there. Usually this means installing parts of the set into matching colored slots. Line up the gap on the bottom of the RAM with the notch in the slot on the motherboard and gently set it in the correct place. Press down firmly but carefully on top of the RAM stick near the ends until it clicks into place. Close everything up and turn your power supply back on. When you boot up the computer, you can use your system profiler to ensure the correct amount of RAM is shown. Okay. So as uh, we alluded to a couple of seconds ago, yeah, basically is as simple as that. It's just, you know, make sure we uh, do not break it. And as he stated, uh, make sure we, we have some type of protective gear on to not fry any of the chips. So how much memory do I need? Well, that's all obviously depending on the person in the operating system, as we said, a 32-bit operating system only goes up to four. And then you got the 64 gigabit, uh, sorry, 64 bit windows. Uh, that one could use up to 128 gigs of RAM. Once again, depending on your operating system, if you'll notice Windows 7 Home Premium, although it's 64 bits, it could only deal up to 16 gigs of RAM. So be careful what you're buying out there because if your operating system, although your motherboard can handle it, but if your operating system cannot handle it, it's going to be, unfortunately, uh, money thrown out the window until we get a better operating system. Questions, doubts? How to find how much memory is installed. As we saw earlier, we could either go into the bio screen itself. It'll tell you in each channel. Uh, slot, if you'll notice here in the bio screen on the bottom, we have the channel A, slot zero, slot one, channel B, slot zero, slot one. It tells you what's the size of each one. It'll tell you also the total added up. Same thing with the operating system itself. If I go into uh, <clears throat> my this computer here, I right click properties. As soon as I click on there, on the screen, you'll notice it'll tell me exactly what's my bits and how much. I have installed. Same thing with my processor. Questions or doubts? Next, how do I physically install new modules? Well, we just saw we got to power down the system. We make sure that we obviously uh, Push the button, make sure it discharges everything, remove all modules, hopefully putting on ESD protection, be gloves or whatever sorts, line up the notches, make sure. One quick way we could do it is usually if we lie it sideways, just to, you know, or parallel to it, so that we could see if the notches align. So instead of going up and down like this, if I actually put it, uh, like that and just try to align so I can see the, does the notch match there if not I flip over and again check it'll be easier than trying to push it in to figure out if it fits did that make sense or no all right so after installing the mod, uh, memory of, of course always verify usually when you boot up the BIOS is going to tell you hey do you want to agree you got so much memory now you hit F1 or whatever button it tells you to save it to the CMOS, and then when you come up, make sure that your OS is also re, uh, recognizing it, because it could be that our OS is does not recognize it because it's not capable of, so that's another one. As we saw in the little thing, we just need to make sure we push on both sides. I wouldn't push on one side unless if I'm doing the little seesaw action at the end, and usually at the tips, not in the middle. These little notches usually lock themselves into place and snap in because of the fact that under it, you'll see here, there's a little hinge. So as soon as you see or push in the memory, it pushes the hammer who actually pushes the notch into place. There's no need for you yourself to do anything. If you're doing it correct, it will lock itself. You will hear it snap into place. After upgrading or installing new RAM, if memory does not snap into the slot easily or the notch is not lined up at all, is obviously incapable or incompatible with the configuration of the motherboard. It could be that you have 
DDR2 instead of DDR3 or some other type of memory. Maybe you have so DIMMs instead of DIMMs. I can't uh, tell you unless if we're physically looking at it, right? Document for system and, and motherboards that may be missing or not available in older PCs. If a RAM is valuable, it has not changed and the module might not be installed correctly or in the right bank. Even the bank and the BIOS could be disabled, so be careful. It may not be that you just didn't install it correctly, it's just that it itself is not being recognized within the, the BIOS. Questions, doubts? Lastly, a, lot, a very famous one when we're dealing with memory is the famous beeps, as we stated, is if there's something wrong and it cannot display information specifically, if I have no memory, we learn the CPU is gonna pass it to the memory who passes it to wherever it's supposed to go. So if it's going to my screen and my memory is bad, there's no way I can show you that vis uh, with a visual rep representation. So I'll start my little beep Morse code of short and longs to let you know what exactly went wrong. You could take a wild guess at that point that most likely without looking for it, you touch the memory and it itself has to be something happened. You didn't see it in, so it's beeping. So warning signs and troubleshooting. The blue screen of death. Be aware of that guy, BSOD, Windows, doesn't put that one just to torture you. Does anybody know what the BSOD does tell you besides scare the living daylight out of you? The, the it's a panic, so that means there's some uh, code error either in CPU or RAM. Something failed, so it gives you that code, and that weird code that you see in the screen as the error code is you can look it up. You can tell it Windows 7 error code, blue screen error code, such and such. It'll tell you exactly which RAM module, if it's a CPU or whatever it is, because where it was and where it crashed is what it's gonna tell you. So Windows is pretty good. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know that that BSOD usually tells you exactly where it crashed, what happened. System works fine when it first started, but it begins to have problems. It starts slowing down, freezing, hesitating, and moving slowly uh, are usually problems with it. System doesn't boot at all, and all we hear is beeps. Usually that's also one of the issues with memory modules. Maybe themselves got uh, <clears throat> damaged with heat itself, and then they need to be replaced. So solutions. Alexa, if you could help us with the slide of solutions. Solution to try the power safety. Reboot systems with clear RAM memory. And to buy a concept post to disable abbreviated start to check for memory issues. Check memory in another system. Check for overheating. Test power supply for failing, overloading, or overheating. Testing using software, website troubleshooting, or a Windows utility program to be sure it is a memory issue. Thank you. Definitely here, this one here is the biggest uh, trick of all, is the post, usually there's a quick one and then there's a long one. <clears throat> so you wanna get rid of the abbreviated uh, post and let it do the thorough one. Usually in the BIOS, you can go in there and be able to uh, set that up without any, any problems. Um, any questions overall on this slide? Quick question. Um, Windows 10 now does little uh, QC scan. That's the code error, right? The blue screen you're saying? Yeah, for Windows 10, they give you like a little uh, uh, scan code instead of a code number. Oh, yeah, they're getting fancy. Now you can take a picture of it, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, I found one. where Windows 10 hides it now. By the way, guys, it's under performance options instead of under the drive itself for some weird reason. Here's your virtual memory. You can hit change. I, instead of letting Windows, I could actually customize it. That's how much free space I have. So I could mandate, instead of being 16, I can mandate to being 32. I can mandate it to being maybe 
even further, whatever I want, if I want it to be one gigabyte uh, of data or something like that. Questions? And then the maximum, uh, the maximum also I can put it in there too. Usually you want to leave this alone and let Windows handle that. That way they're, they're, you don't have problems because when you force it, guess what? If you force a maximum and it reaches it, what's going to happen? Crash. It may crash or it's going to get very slow. And is another thing, if our initial size is too big, we could also wind up just uh, going too slow. So it's always is recommended, it unless if you know what you want for specific windows, to leave windows to do that for themselves. Is it called uh, boost ready or is that different? The what? Uh, boost ready. Boost ready, I believe, is something different. Boost How ready. Can you use external drives like yep. the USB. That is correct. Boost ready. Oh, you use okay. an actual USB uh, to do that instead of the okay. the hard drive. So this is internal, and then boost ready is actually external type really? of virtual memory. Yes, correct. Thank you for clarification. Not a problem. Any other questions or doubts? Next one here, uh, DeAndre, if you could help us with warning size and troubleshooting on this page. Okay, warning size and troubleshooting. What should you do to protect both yourself and a computer from harm when installing or upgrading memory? Should I answer that? Yes, please. Um, you always want to like ground yourself with the strap. Mm -hmm. Make sure the PC is powered off. Um, also turn it on after you power it off to get all electricity out, and just like be gentle. Okay. Thank you. Next, uh, Justin. The first, second bullet point there, please, and the question related to it. RAM installation varies by module. How will you know which steps to follow? Be sure it is a memory issue. To be sure, yeah, to be sure it is a memory issue. Um, the main thing you want to make sure is that the notch actually fits along with the notch on the motherboard. Yeah. And the majority of them is the same steps, right? We're going to be, uh, t taking it out and putting in the same, but the, the variance is just making sure we align, uh, the memory into the place. And then the same thing, make sure it's seated in good, right? Yes. So what will you do to ensure that you are prepared to work on many different machines with various issues? What, what, what will you do? Jordan, what will you do to ensure that you are prepared to work on many different machines with various issues in reference to we're talking here memory? Got to study them you know, look up usually manufacturers, um, as Drew put it, usually the manufacturer's information, they'll have all the information on whichever hardware that you're working on specifically. So at any chance, at any time, you just look it up. Yeah. Another way, uh, there's manufacturers sometimes have their own little testing software to check the, uh, the actual memory for you. Uh, the BIOS itself, right? I can go into the BIOS and, and, and do, like we said, instead of the fast post, have it do the thorough post. Uh, operating system itself, I believe you can make it do certain things so that when it boots up, it checks everything. But uh, th there's obviously different ways that we can go about it. Learning and adapting to the different types of machines and modules, right? Recognizing them. RIM and SIM have become outdated 
technology. What will you do if DIM suddenly becomes obsolete? What will you do to stay current with technology as it evolves? As to everyone here, what can you do? We saw Again, the, the original ones, which were the DDRs, are gone, and then we went to DDR2. Now we're up to DDR3s and 4s. But eventually, when we first started, it was either a RIM or a SIM. Now we're up to DIMs. So what happens if, if we just keep on advancing, advancing? What, what skills or what, what can I lean on? Adaptability. Yeah. Adaptability, OK. Anything else that I can use? Man, what's Future my, orientation. What's my little hat I should put on? My brain can grow. Creative mindset? Growth mindset or creative mindset? Uh, yeah. Within growth mindset, you make sure I have my creative mindset, persistence, right? All of these things are going to help me to make sure that I stay on top and, and willing to learn. Because if we're not willing to continue to learn, we're going to get stuck and we're going to be ourselves outdated. As I stated, since 1987 that I started, we went from having no mouse to now even touch screens in our houses. Uh, from having five megabyte hard drives. Yes, I said five megabyte hard drives, uh, which were as big as my head almost to now these small little things that can fit inside your iPad that has over 64 gigabytes, or even sometimes, what is it, 128 gigabytes these things are coming with, or 256? It's amazing what they can fit in, in, in technology. It just keeps on advancing and advancing. So we will never stop learning. We gotta be ready to continue that. So persistence, adaptability, all those taking play. Thank you. We're gonna jump into our uh, groups here. And basically, when we get into our groups, we're going to find a place, basically, obviously, bring your textbooks and notes with you. In your groups, one person will start off and list the first step. Then the second one will then continue on of what we would do, basically, in what we believe are the steps for installing and or making decisions of memory. So our book will have those steps in there. If anybody want to shout out what's the page, they saw it. If they were looking through the book while we were reading this, the gray book, anybody saw those steps in there? We said it was page what it started on? It starts on page 44, but uh -huh. okay. the actual steps might be somewhere deeper. I think it's 57. Page 57 should have the steps. Good, good. Who are we voting yeah. one? Yeah. I'm going. So right, we got I can start. And I'm going to go for mine too. Okay. And Justin. Okay. Give me a second. Let's go with group one. Yeah. So the first step will be to switch off the power. And the second one will be to put putting the ESC strap and grounding yourself. Third one, pushing the clamps to each side. And fourth one is to inserting the RAM and if there are multiple RAMs for multiple slots of of a single channel or dual channel, then you can repeat the, the same process again. Now, after inserting it, you can. Uh, switch the power on and you can then verify it either through device manager or by your setup or, or through some software or or tool you have in the computer okay 
Got all the steps? Okay. Yes. No? All right. Am I missing something here? I don't know. I thought I was expecting <laughs> two of you to, to work together. That's why I was, uh, I, I thought Christina was going to start talking now. No problem. I guess. Well, I didn't know if it was, you had to go through all of them. That's why I, I didn't say anything. No, it was the, we were going to try oh. to do the game where one would say one and two, then the, the next one oh, would say one, two, three. Sorry for that. No, no, no problem at all. We'll, yeah. we'll try with group two, group two, see if we could mimic that and see if we don't get lost when we're playing that one. Thank you, though. Uh, that was all the stops, steps. I just wanted to make sure in case if somebody had some other type of feedback. Team two? Do you want our steps or like Christine, the steps we came up with? Oh, know. okay. Yeah, yeah. The, doing the game where uh, first person goes first and then uh, says the first two, then the second person is going to say the first three, and then the next person's coming up is going to say one, two, three, four. Try to make that game like that. See if, if it gets harder for you to figure out where you are. Okay. Uh, turn off system, Daniel. All right. So it's turning off the system and then grounding yourself. Okay, Christina, back. Oh, turn off system, ground yourself, press on tabs. Daniel? Then you turn off the PC, you ground yourself, you press down on the little tab, and then you, ex and, um, you basically extract the old RAM and insert the new. Okay. Turn off the system, ground yourself, press on tabs, insert RAM, or remove the RAM off the thing, tabs, and then power on system. All right. One more step, I think. Daniel, add, put it all together. Um, you turn off the, um, the PC, you ground yourself, you press against the little tabs, you extract the old RAM, and uh, place the new... Uh, make sure it's locked, and then you power on the PC. Well, so after I turn it on, what should I be doing? Hmm? After I turn it back on, what's, there should be one more step that I should be doing. You should be making sure it's working. Yeah, right. I make sure the post on the RAM, on the BIOS, it gives me the amount that I'm expecting, and on the OS itself, right? Yes. So... We're going to see these two videos real quick right before we uh, take our break for lunch. First one here is overview of memory types. If you're looking at the specifications of your computer and you notice a section that describes memory, or somebody asks you how much memory is inside of your computer, they're referring to the amount being the size of an SSD or the capacity of a hard drive, we're referring to the components inside of your computer where all of the transactions are taking place. When you're using the programs and the data on your computer, they're moved off of your SSD or your hard drive and they're put into RAM so that you can perform calculations on that information and then store that information back on the SSD or the hard drive when you're finished. Your desktop computer or your laptop will have slots where you can install the random access memory modules. The different motherboards may have different types of slots, but it makes it very easy to add, remove, or upgrade the memory that's in your system. The process of moving information in and out of memory is happening all the time inside of your computer. So the faster memory you have, the faster the overall performance will be of your computer. Every motherboard will be a bit different on how fast these transfers can occur in and out of memory. So check the documentation of your computer to see exactly how fast you can expect your memory to run. The type of physical package that installs into those slots on your motherboard is a DIMM. This is a dual inline memory module. It's called a dual inline memory module because this memory module has a series of contacts on one side of this module. It has another set of contacts on the other side of the module, and those two contacts are different on each side of that memory module. These dual inline memory modules have a 64-bit data width, so we're able to transfer data from these memory modules in chunks of 64 bits at a time. 
The memory that's inside of a laptop is probably a smaller version of the DIMM. This is the small outline dual inline memory module, and it's about half the width of a standard DIMM that you would find in a desktop computer. You can find the DIMMs and the SO DIMMs available in DDR2, DDR3, and DDR4 flavors of SD RAM. We'll explain what all of those are later on in this video. If you're using a SO DIMM, it's probably inside of a laptop or a mobile device because of the size. You're able to fit a lot more information into a smaller area, which is important for those mobile devices. Here's a good size comparison of these two. The DIMM is the larger memory module that you would find in a desktop computer. And the SO DIMM, you can see, is about half the size. And you would find that in laptops and other mobile devices. The type of random access memory that is on these DIMMs is called a dynamic random access memory. It's called dynamic because it constantly needs to be refreshed. This is very different than the type of memory you might have in a flash drive where you would store information and then unplug it to move it to another computer. That flash drive doesn't need to be constantly refreshed to maintain that information. But the memory that we use inside of our computers is a much faster memory, and it requires this constant refreshing to be able to maintain the data that's on those DIMMs. If you were to power off your computer and no longer able to refresh that memory, everything that was inside of those DIMM modules would soon disappear. The use of the word random inside dynamic random access memory is because we can access anything in that memory at any place at any time. This is very different than how we used to access information on a magnetic tape, where you'd have to wind through the tape to get to the section that you need to read. With dynamic RAM, you can simply specify an address, grab that information, and then be able to access that data. The type of dynamic random access memory that you would find on today's computers is a type called synchronous dynamic random access memory. It's synchronous because it is synchronized with the common system clock of your computer. The standard flow of communication based on these clock cycles allows the system to queue things up in a very standard format. This is different than earlier types of dynamic random access memory where there was no synchronization. But in today's desktops and laptop computers, all of the memory that we're going to be using will be synchronous RAM. Here's the way that we're able to use these clock cycles to be able to pull information off of this memory. In a single data rate memory, or SDR, we have a single clock cycle. You can see the up and down wave of the clock cycle. And there's a number of clock cycles listed on this diagram. And through each single clock cycle with the single data rate memory, we can pull one bit of data, which means if we have one, two, three, four, five, and six different clock cycles, then we can pull six different pieces of data. With dual data rate memory, we still have the same clock cycle. Things haven't changed as far as the clock going up and down and having those six different clock cycles. The difference with double data rate memory is that we're able to pull information on the upside of the clock cycle and the downside of the clock cycle, meaning that there's two different bits of data that we can gather in the same clock cycle. That's where the double in the double data rate comes from. In older computer systems, you might even find double data rate generation 2 or DDR2 SD RAM. These are memory modules that were faster than the original double data rate memory modules, and they're not backwards compatible with those. In fact, they're not forward compatible either. If you have a computer system that requires DDR2, then you must use a DDR2 module in that system. You're not able to replace it with a DDR, a DDR3, or a DDR4. The generation of memory after DDR2 is DDR3, or double data rate 3. DDR3 RAM has twice the data rates of DDR2, so greatly improved performance for those systems that could support DDR3. It also improved the maximum size on a single DIMM to 16 gigabytes of memory. And again, if you have a motherboard that requires DDR3 memory, then you must use a DDR3 memory module. You can't take the DDR2 modules from an older system and move them into a DDR3 system. They won't fit into the module slots at all. One of the newer generations of DDR memory is DDR4. This fourth generation of memory has speed improvements over the third generation, and it increases the maximum size of a single DIMM up to 64 gigabytes per memory module. 
And as you might expect, the changes with DDR4 also mean there's no backwards compatibility to earlier versions of modules either. Not only did we change the technology between these different generations of DDR memory, but we also physically changed the package. So when we say that it's not backwards compatible, it's not even an option. You can see there is a key or a small slot that's inside the memory module, and the slot is in a different place in each generation of memory type. This means that if you have a motherboard that expects DDR4 memory modules, this is the only type of memory module that will physically fit into the memory slot. If you're trying to install a memory module in a computer and you notice that it's not fitting perfectly, it may be because you have the wrong type of DDR memory. The memory that's inside of our computers is not infallible. You can have electrical hiccups. There could be memory that is not seated properly, or there just might be bad connections for the memory that's inside of your system. And occasionally, there might be a bit that accidentally gets flipped from a 1 to a 0 or vice versa. If you have a critical computer system, however, you really can't afford to have memory that might be changing some of the values as it's going through the computer, regardless of how rare that might be. So your virtual machines, you might have database servers or web servers, or systems that are required to be up and running all the time. Because of that, we have a type of memory that's able to check itself. One of these types is called parity memory, where it adds an additional parity bit to the information that's associated with a byte that's going through your computer. Parity memory is great, but it won't find every possible scenario. For example, if your memory becomes corrupted in a way that the parity is still correct, then it's not not going to notice that there is anything wrong with the information that's inside of that memory. And parity memory is not designed to actually correct anything. It can only inform you that a problem has occurred with your memory. A type of memory that is able to make a correction is called error correcting code memory, or ECC memory. This is not only identifying that there has been an error with the memory of your computer, but it's able to correct that memory on the fly. Not all of your computers are using ECC memory. In fact, very few of your computers are probably using memory that is ECC memory. The ECC memory is a bit more expensive, and it's really designed for those enterprise type systems. So a very large server may have a motherboard that requires ECC memory. In fact, it won't work unless you install ECC memory into that device. It's sometimes difficult to tell, though, because the memory looks identical to non-ECC memory. So make sure you keep your memory modules together with the documentation that came with them so you'll know exactly what memory type you're working with. A lot of people have asked me what this parity bit really means. So I created this diagram to show how parity works inside of our computer. These parity bits inside memory are usually even parity. That means that the parity bit is making an even number across all of these bits that are inside of our systems. Let's take an example, for instance, this first byte that we have at the top. And a byte is these eight bits. So with these bits, one through eight are one, 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 zero, zero, one, one, one. The way that parity works is it will examine how many ones happen to be in that byte. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six. And since that number is an even number, the six value is even, we don't need another one associated with that. So the parity bit is going to be 0. Let's look at the next byte. We have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. Well, we can see we only have a single one. So this is currently odd number of ones. So to make this an even number of ones, our parity bit would now be a 1. And that's how we're able to determine whether the parity inside of this particular byte is correct. Let's do the last byte. We have 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. If we count the number of ones, we have 1, 2, 3 ones. That is an odd number. So we know that we need to add an additional one for this entire string that makes this an even parity. 
So now that you have this parity bit associated with this data, how do you determine if anything has gone wrong with the particular memory byte? Well, let's have a look, for instance, at these examples. You can see we have a byte and a parity bit associated with it. So let's do our calculation again. Let's count the number of ones inside of this byte. We have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. There's three bits, and a single parity bit was added to make this an even number. And since we have even parity, that particular piece of memory is exactly correct. Let's do the next one, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, with a parity bit of 0. And if we're evaluating that, you can see that we have an odd number of 1s, which means something has gone wrong with this memory. Because our parity bit was 0 and we have an odd number of 1s, we know that something went wrong with that section of memory. And let's do one more, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, with a parity bit of 1. And if we count the number of ones, we have one, two, three, four ones, which is an even number. So we know that that piece of information in memory is absolutely correct. Another memory characteristic you may run into is memory that's described as registered memory. This is memory that has a buffer inside of the memory. There's additional register inside of the memory. And it's a buffer between the memory itself and the memory controller. You'll see this sometimes referred to as buffered memory, because that really is describing what's going on. This is obviously one that's used on very high-end systems. So you'll see this on servers, on systems that need a stable operating environment, you will rarely find registered memory requirements on a machine that's simply a laptop or a desktop computer. You can sometimes identify visually when you're using registered memory because there may be additional chips right in the middle that's used as the buffer itself. In this case, this particular memory has a sticker on it that shows the type of model. And you can see this is a 512 megabyte memory. It's DDR memory running at 333 megahertz, has a CL value of 2.5. This is ECC memory, so this is error correcting memory, but it is also registered memory, you can see the REG that's right there. And these things can be used together. You can have ECC memory that is not registered, and you can have non-ECC memory that is registered. But it's very common to see ECC memory and registered memory being used together in this way, especially if it's going to be used on a high-end system. If you're putting memory inside of your computer, you may want to see if your motherboard supports multi-channel memory. This is where we can install memory in pairs or in trios, and it maximizes the throughput of that memory in and out of those memory modules. And this may be important, especially if you're doing some high-performance computing. You're going to want to have the fastest possible throughput by simply adding the proper number of modules onto your motherboard. These memory combinations should also match. You should ideally have exactly the same memory types that will be used in these different channels of memory. You'll often see that the memory module channels are also colored. So you would put the same type of memory modules in for each of the colors. In this example, this is a motherboard I have that is a dual channel motherboard. And you can see that you would put one of the memory modules in black, and the other part of the dual channel would be in the other black module. So if I wanted to maximize the throughput in and out of memory on my motherboard and I only had two memory modules, I would make sure that they are installed into the two memory module slots that are colored exactly the same. One characteristic of memory is whether it is single-sided or double-sided memory. And there are, unfortunately, a couple of ways that this can be interpreted. One is very literally. You can have a memory module that only has chips on one side of the module and no chips on the other. So in that case, it would be a single-sided memory module. But some memory modules will have memory chips on both sides of the physical module. And some people will refer to that as double-sided memory. But there's another way to interpret interpret single-sided versus double-sided memory that really doesn't describe the physical package of the memory itself. In this case, we're really referring to the ranks of memory. Ranks is how we separate memory on a single module so that they can be accessed with the memory controller. Sometimes these separate ranks are called sides. So you might have a single-sided or double-sided memory referring to a single rank or a double rank on a memory. These would really be 
be separated out into two different pieces. This, for instance, might be a memory module with two ranks, and you could easily describe that also as two sides. So you really have to ask a person who's talking to you about single-sided and double-sided memory of what they're referring to. Are they referring to the physical package of the memory on the memory module, or are they referring to the ranks of memory as it's accessed by the memory controller? If you're looking to upgrade the memory inside of your computer or install some onto a new computer build, you may go online and see what's available. And then you can very quickly see there are many different kinds of memory specifications. Memory has a very tight tolerance. You need exactly the right memory for your motherboard. So your first stop should be your motherboard documentation. This will be the absolute authority to determine what type of memory you need to purchase for your motherboard. If I look at the manual I have for my motherboard, I can see that mine says 4x DIMM, which means there are four DIMM slots in my motherboard. It will take a maximum of 32 gigabytes of memory. It is expecting DDR3 1600 slash 1333 megahertz, so I can get either speed of memory to go inside of my motherboard. And it's requiring non-ECC, so it's non-error correcting code memory, and it is unbuffered memory or non-registered memory modules. I have to make sure I get exactly this specification so that it will work properly when I install it into my motherboard. Fortunately, a lot of the sites where you can purchase memory online will also have online guides. So you can put into their website the make and the model of your computer, and it will give you a number of options that are available. And you can then cross-reference the options that they're telling you against what you see on your motherboard documentation and make sure that they sync up. If you look at the search results online, you may find that you have many different options available. Even for my motherboard, I could put DDR3-1600 memory, or I can put DDR3-1333 memory. So it's different speeds available. Of course, the 1600 memory is faster, and it's probably going to be more expensive. But if all I need is a system that is performing simple web browsing, maybe I can save a few dollars and get the slower memory, but still be able to have a memory upgrade and capacity that I'm looking for. Well, that pretty much wraps up our morning session in reference to motherboard. Uh, <laughs> Rams, where he lost there. Any questions or doubts in reference to this session?